for 15086. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. We now move to topical questions. Question one, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the uh, Scottish Government what help it is making available to communities affected by flooding. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. So, so Storm Desmond over the weekend impacted on a number of areas, particularly the Fries and Galloway, the Borders and Tayside. I chaired meetings of the Scottish Government Resilience Committee during the course of this event to ensure all the appropriate support was in place to mitigate potential damage. I am sure the Parliament will echo my thanks to public servants and volunteers who worked tirelessly to protect those communities at risk. The Minister for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform visited Hoyt this morning to see some of these impacts and to meet some of those involved in the response. I have activated the Bellwind scheme to provide support to local authorities to assist with the immediate and unforeseen costs of dealing with the flood damage. Joe McAlpine. Thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. We, we have seen the, the devastating consequences of flooding in the south of Scotland and also um, on our neighbours in, in Cumbria in the northwest of England. And uh, I, I know that some of the areas in Cumbria that were most devastated have had expensive flood defences put in place and I wondered what lessons we might learn here from the failure of those defences given that we are planning our own defences in future. Cabinet Secretary. I think obviously the, the circumstances in the northwest of England have been uh, dramatically more uh, difficult uh, for, the, for the communities involved than has been the case uh, throughout Scotland, although we have had in uh, Hoyk, uh, Newcastleton and also in Dumfries um, uh, also in uh, Langham as well, some very significant impacts of the, uh, the, 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 the flooding that's taken place. Very careful planning has to be undertaken in relation to flood alleviation schemes. Uh, it is essential that a very comprehensive assessment is made of the dynamics of water flows in particular areas and the impact of the natural environment and the built landscape in that process. And of course, what has been a particular challenge in the northwest of England has been the fact that the rainfall that has been uh, that has emerged um, has sig been significantly greater than was anticipated in the planning for the flood prevention scheme. So I think the, it is important that in the planning of these schemes we look very carefully at uh, a, a wide variety of different factors to ensure that when we're making a major capital investment, which all of these schemes represent, uh, we properly take into account all relevant factors to ensure the capability and the capacity of flood prevention measures. Ms McAlpine? No? Ellie Murray. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking the major emergency team in Dumfries and Galloway for their very prompt action in getting flood prevention uh, materials to communities, including the White Sands and Friars Venel. Um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, there is a £2.1 million scheme for Langham uh, in development uh, between the Council of SEPA and Scottish Water. Uh, and given the situation in Langham this weekend, which was not as bad as we feared it was going to be, uh, would he please encourage organisations and his colleagues, those organisations responsible to the Scottish Government, to work with the Council uh, to bring this scheme forward as soon as possible? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, first of all, can I echo the point that uh, Dr Murray made? I thought that in each of the three principal local authority areas that faced particular challenge over the weekend, uh, I thought preparations were well executed in advance um, the, to ensure that we were as prepared as we could be. And I think without that preparation, the implications would have been significantly worse. So I think the preparations that were undertaken in a number of areas uh, avoided some of the serious impacts being felt. In relation to Dr Murray's substantive question, um, there is a, uh, some work being undertaken by SEPA which looks at flood risk strategies um, over a six-year flood risk plan cycle. Uh, these are long-term works that take time to deliver and uh, there will be, uh, of course, decisions to be made about the schemes that will be included in that process. A number of schemes have already been advanced uh, by the Scottish Government, whether those are in Selkirk, Gala Shields, Brecon, the River Ness, Ammon Bank, the Water of Leith, Elgin, Forest over the course of the last few years, and there will be further decisions will be taken in this respect. And uh, I will ensure that the points that have been raised by Dr Murray are properly taken into account in that process. John Lamont. Thank you, President Officer. Can I also pay tribute to the emergency services and volunteers in the border area who worked very hard to mitigate um, the flood damage in the borders. 
My question relates to the flooding in Hoyk. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that there is a flood prevention scheme um, for the town, which has been in the pipeline since 2010. Will the Scottish Government now do everything it can to accelerate the planning and creation of this scheme for Hoyk? And specifically, can the Government commit today to providing the full funding allocation to Borders Council so that there are no unnecessary delays in implementing the scheme? Cabinet Secretary. As, as Mr Lamont will be aware, first of all, I welcome what he said about the emergency services and um, the Scottish Borders Council experienced the, uh, the greatest degree of difficulty to wrestle with and they had to wrestle with that over two sites in Newcastleton and uh, Hoyk principally, although there were other areas that were affected. Um, in relation to the point on the determination of flood schemes, this is a, a, a discussion that is jointly taken forward between the Government and the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities to prioritise uh, flood schemes. Um, I, I certainly know that the Hoyt scheme is well advanced and there will be decisions taken about the schemes that are taken forward as part of the multi-year financial settlements that are put in place uh, as a consequence of decisions made jointly with COSLA. Jim Hume. Yeah, thank you very much. I welcome the, the, the Minister's mention about the, the Belwyn scheme coming into play. I also, of course, recognise all the uh, emergency service and volunteers who, who came into play. And I think we should also... Uh, recognise, of course, Cumbria uh, receiving nearly 14 inches of rain, so I uh, uh, appreciate that. Uh, I would reiterate uh, John Lamont's plea for, for, for Hoyk and the schemes uh, to be progressed there, but also uh, would be interested in uh, Mr Swinney's view on the Selkirk scheme, which may have been damaged, and uh, would the government be happy to support any damage that may have been done to that scheme, which is, as uh, uh, Mr Swinney knows, is not quite completed? Cabinet Secretary. I certainly I, I saw some photographic images of the challenges that were experienced in Selkirk and of course um, as part of the analysis uh, we will, I would be very surprised if we do not find that even the partial completion of the Selkirk scheme was of benefit in protecting householders and businesses in Selkirk as a consequence of the work that has been undertaken. Um, we, uh, I, I would reiterate the comments that I made in relation to Mr Lamont's question. Um, the, there will be a process of decision-making around which schemes are taken forward by the, um, the, uh, as part of the flooding investment uh, undertaken between the government and COSLA. Um, this is a, an area of very active cooperation between the government and our local authority partners, and I will ensure that these issues are properly considered uh, as part of the decision-making in this area. Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that in my constituency in Aberfeldy and Callender, and in three parts of the city of Stirling, businesses and homes were inundated with water. And I wonder if it helped facilitate a discussion between myself and SEPA to talk about how accurate their floodline information is, because actually the floodline material that came through from SEPA did not reflect the actuality on the ground. I think, well, that's a, a very significant issue. Obviously, we've invested heavily in the flood forecasting service, which has been taken forward, and in the floodline information. Um, we uh, point members of the public very directly to that information. Um, it was obviously information that I was studying, um, frankly, minute by minute in the course of uh, Friday and Saturday and on Sunday morning. Um, so the, uh, the, the importance of its accuracy uh, must be um, assured. Uh, so I'll certainly raise those issues with SEPA to ensure that uh, members of the public are uh, able to access quality information that will allow them to determine uh, the best pre uh, precautions they can take to resolve these issues. Thank you. Question number two, Alice McInnes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the findings of the fatal accident inquiry into the Glasgow bin lorry crash. The Lord Advocate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Sheriff Becker issued his detailed judgment yesterday, which included a series of recommendations which impact on the medical profession, the DVLA, local authorities and the Secretary of State for Transport. The regulations around driver licensing and assessment are reserved to the UK Government, and these fatal accident inquiry findings raise significant issues for consideration. We trust that these will be reflected on and given the necessary due attention to ensure that road safety measures are as robust and effective as possible across Scotland and the UK. The Solicitor General wrote to the Secretary of State for Transport following the conclusion of the evidence uh, in the FAI, setting out the defects in the system and drawing his attention to this and other FAIs covering 
the same issues. Yesterday, she wrote again to the Secretary of State, enclosing a copy of the judgment and offering her, assist uh, her, her assistance and the assistance of the Scottish Government in implementing the relevant recommendations. Letters are in process uh, to the medical profession and local authorities, drawing their attention to Sheriff Beckett's recommendation. I trust that these bodies will take forward and implement the detailed and sensible recommendations made with a view to preventing such a tragedy from happen happening again. Uh, let me take this opportunity to offer my heartfelt sympathies to all the families uh, for their losses. It's a difficult time of year leading to the anniversary of the tragedy and they are in uh, all our thoughts and prayers. Thank the Lord Advocate for that response and add I too, my thoughts too are with the families. It must have been an extremely difficult time for friends and relatives of those who died last December to sit through the inquiry. And while they now have some answers about how this tragedy unfolded, other significant questions remain. Opportunities were missed to prevent this crash. And the Sheriff concluded that Harry Clark, and I quote, repeatedly lied in order to gain and retain jobs and licences. It took just six short weeks for the police to conclude their investigation, and the Crown a further four weeks only to conclude there would be no prosecution of the driver. I have a letter here from the Lord Advocate himself which states that the driver was never formally interviewed by the police, never considered a suspect. In light of this and the evidence that came to light during the FEI, is the Lord Advocate absolutely certain that the investigation into criminal proceedings was as exhaustive and ri as rigorous as it should have been? The Lord Advocate. Uh, well, two points. There was no evidence which emerged at the um, fatal accident inquiry, no information that emerged that the Crown was unaware of, and there's nothing which uh, emerged in the judgment of Sheriff Beckett that the Crown was unaware of, and nothing in Sheriff Beckett's judgment, uh, in my view, undermines the decision uh, taken not to prosecute uh, the driver of the bin lorry. As you will be aware, the Crown published detailed written reasons at the conclusion of the evidence in the fatal accident inquiry. This sets out the legal and evidential basis for the decision uh, not to prosecute. Uh, the Crown well appreciates that this decision is not a popular one, but the Crown cannot take decisions on the basis that they are popular but wrong in law. That would be unconstitutional and abusive process and would rightly result in severe criticism by the court and a loss of confidence in the Crown. Thank you. I would just remark that the Crown acts in the public interest in these cases. Uh, the Sheriff did recommend that the Crown should review whether its policies prevent or discourage prosecution under the Road Traffic Act. Will the Lord Advocate confirm that they will review that? What is the timescale for this review? And will the Lord Advocate ensure its findings are made public in order that the public can better understand the decision not to prosecute in this case? Lord Advocate. Uh, the uh, recommendation made by Sheriff Beckett uh, referred to two sections of the Road Traffic Act, sections 174 and 94. Both relate to making false statements and withholding material information from the DVLA and insurance companies. Uh, the Sheriff Beckett, in his determination, noted uh, in making these recommendations that he was not referring to any prosecution decisions relating to Mr Clark. It related to Dr Parry of the DVLA's evidence at the fatal accident inquiry that there had been no cases and no prosecutions uh, for these uh, offences from 2005. And Sheriff Beckett was rightly concerned to draw attention to that. Uh, in uh, answer to your question, yes, uh, the Crown will uh, reflect on Sheriff Beckett's recommendation. I can advise you that the Crown has already been in touch with its counterpart south of the border, the CPS, to discuss uh, this recommendation, which we will take forward uh, with the CPS and with the DVLA to ensure that any prosecution policy and the reporting and investigation of these offences are fit for purpose and that there is no barrier uh, in relation to the investigation, reporting and prosecution uh, for these offences. Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am sure, like others, um, we all feel great sorrow for the families affected. Um, can I ask, given that the families have now said that they intend to seek a private prosecution, um, what can the Crown and the Scottish Government do to facilitate that process? Lord Advocate. Uh, well, uh, Jackie Bailey will obviously understand that I'm in a, a position where I really can't comment on that. Firstly, I haven't seen uh, a Bill of Criminal Letters. Uh, and secondly, it relates to 
uh, the prosecution of Mr Clark as a private prosecution. So it's really not for me to comment on that. Uh, obviously, what I can say is that if and when such a bill is lodged, uh, the Crown will obviously carefully consider that uh, and what its position is. And we'll make that clear to the court and to the families. Uh, again, uh, we're well aware of the sensitivities of this, uh, well aware of the tragic loss which all these families have had to suffer, uh, and are well aware of their feelings on this. But I just reiterate uh, that this decision not to prosecute was not taken uh, in a vacuum, not taken without uh, full possession of all the necessary information, and was not taken without assessing what the law of evidence, sufficiency of evidence and corroboration uh, was. Uh, and again, it was looked at by a number of senior lawyers in the Crown Office, senior Crown Counsel, and endorsed by a law officer. Uh, so uh, we will obviously consider any Bill of Criminal Letters to look at whether a sufficiency of evidence is established in the Bill of Criminal Letters. Uh, and once we've had an opportunity to do that, we'll obviously uh, make our position clear to the families and to the court. Thank you. Uh, we now move to the next item of business.